Okay, uh, we would like to welcome um, all commissioners and uh, the listening public and staff to the called meeting of the North Carolina Historical Commission, October 10th, 2018. I am Chairman David Ruffin. I want to, uh, first of all, apologize for technical difficulties that we were having uh, difficulty getting onto the live stream, and uh, that has been rectified, we understand. Um, I would like to, um, again, uh, ask all, this is primarily a call-in conference meeting um, for those that are not here in Raleigh, and I'd ask for everyone to mute their phones um, during this meeting uh, until they are being asked to speak. Um, however, first of all, I would like to call the roll because to be sure that we have a quorum. Um, uh, Ms. Barbie. She was with us earlier. She may have trouble getting reconnected. Mr. Dixon. Present. Dr. Fonville. Present. Mr. Avi. I believe he's not going to be able to join us. Ms. Klutz. Present. Dr. Denard. Dr. Johnson. Here. Dr. Bryan. Present. And Mr. Reynolds. Ms. Snowden. Present. We we have a quorum, I believe. That's right, Mr. President, Mr. Chair. Um, I would also like to, um, again, welcome us for this stated uh, a, a meeting. And in the nature of our uh, normal protocols, uh, I do need to ask for a, an affirmative uh, statement from all commission members of, of no uh, conflict of interest on the matters being discussed today. And those matters, generally speaking, are the demolition of the uh, enterprise uh, on the property on Enterprise Street in Raleigh, uh, various matters relative to the development of the North Carolina Civil War and Reconstruction uh, History Center in Fayetteville, the proposed demolition of the former School of the Deaf Infirmity in Morganton, and uh, the proposed construction of the Fairfield Inn and Suites in Morganton. Um, is there anyone on the commission level that has in any way uh, knowingly have a conflict of interest on these matters being discussed today. This is Mary Lynn Bryan. I have a conflict with the Fayetteville Arsenal items being discussed. And we need to get Millie Barbie on the line. Otherwise, we do not have quorum for our actions on the Fayetteville property. Okay. Um, my count says we have seven. Mary we Lynn. knock out Mary Lynn. That's six. That's oh, still six four. is four. Okay. So All we right. do have four. I'm All miscounted. I'm All right. Uh, Dr. Cherry has advised that we um, then call the roll just to, again, be very explicit about the conflict of interest. So, uh, uh, Ms. Barbie, uh, she's not on at this point. Mr. Dixon. Sam, if you can just say if you have conflict of interest or not, we have to do roll call votes and uh, acknowledgments because it's a conference call. Kevin, we're we're okay. Any commissioner can speak up and say if they have a conflict. If they don't speak up, that that's on them. We don't need yeah. to go through a roll call on the conflict. All right, thank you, Mr. Fagan. Uh, at this point, I would like to then. Um, uh, turn over and I, for, uh, turn over to um, Dr. Cherry, who of course is Deputy Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources and State Historic uh, Preservation um, a Officer. And I would like to first of all commend all the work of this staff. Uh, it was within literally hours of the passage of Hurricane Florence that I heard from you that of the work that had already been done in terms of assessing. Uh, damage, and I think that just uh, speaks the, the nature of your dedication of your staff and the department to the preservation, and we thank you from that perspective. But at this point, I would also like you to identify 
staff members right. and other guests that are here for this uh, meeting today, Dr. Cherry. All right. Well, we have staff members here in Raleigh in the room, uh, Parker Backstrom, who uh, takes the minutes for the meeting, Ramona Bartos, who's the administrator of our Historic Preservation Office and is the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer. She's also the Director of the Division of Historical Resources. And we have with us Renee Gladhill Early, who is our Environmental Review Coordinator for the Historic Preservation Office. They're also uh, our General Counsel for uh, the Department, Phil Fagan, who is with us. And we have some uh, tech and communication staff, and I don't know exactly which ones other than Michelle Walker, who are helping us get the, the um, meeting out to the public by a conference call and live streaming on the Internet. Also with us, uh, and we'll begin with her uh, in her presentation, Michelle Lanier, who is uh, the, the, the director of the Division of Historic Sites and Properties. We'd like to um, give the commission a quick mm -hmm. overview of damages to, uh, to the Office of Archives uh, and, and History's facilities due to Hurricane Florence. I will say, before I ask Michelle to begin, that no, we've had no staff members hurt. We've lost no artifacts, no manuscripts, and no permanently valuable archival records. We have lost uh, some records, municipal records, in Pollocksville and Trenton, but we don't know of any permanently valuable records unless we hear later that the board minutes have been uh, gone missing from those towns. So we'll begin with um, Michelle Lanier, who will give the rundown of historic sites and, and Hurricane Florence. Michelle? Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Terry. Uh, I am uh, pleased to give you all this report, and I believe um, that you all have had access to a PowerPoint document that um, has an overview of the damage to historic sites as well as um, photographs. Um, so that was on the email that Parker Backstrom sent out, and I believe that it's also available to the public as well. Um, we did have 13 sites that sustained some level of damage, um, but no buildings were destroyed, as Dr. Terry shared. The most significant damage that we've seen is at Brunswick Town, Fort Anderson, because they were without power and the road was also washed out for several days. And so there's some dehumidification that's happening right now, and there are quite a few trees that are down there. Um, so that site is the only site that remains closed. Um, to the public until we can get that um, site safely accessible again. Um, every single staff member at Brunswick Town Fort Anderson has been now designated to another duty station um, between Fort Fisher State Historic Site, which is just in the neighboring county down in Wilmington, and then we have two staff members who are now based at our Maritime Museum in Southport. So the collegiality across the department has been extraordinary. Um, I do have to make special mention of our craft services um, director, Paul Hill. He, um, at least a week, a week, about a week and a half before Hurricane Florence hit, he went into action, making sure that we all notified every single site manager, all of our maintenance folks, to clear gutters, to clean out drains, to make sure that um, artifacts that were vulnerable could be moved, that we lifted things that were vulnerable off of floors. Um, and because of all of this strong preparation for Hurricane Florence, that really, we believe, helped to mitigate against um, significant damage. We also saw a lot of um, strong collegiality um, and cross-division um, cross support um, from the North Carolina Transportation Museum. They provided two generators that had originally been um, purchased to support a train and didn't quite work for that train. And so they were brand new diesel generators that were able to create a power grid um, and to be installed on a trailer and transported to Brunswick Town before the power was um, reinstated. We were able to, once the road was open, safely get that generator system to Brunswick Town to get the HVAC and security system running. And that was 
that was an effort um, that was really across the division. And then there was a canoe that um, our Office of Archaeology needed to be evacuated out of um, Curry Beach, and we did have staff that helped with that. We also had staff that helped to evaluate some roof damage um, at another museum in the department. Um, we have several staff members that are a part of our kind of community emergency response, as well as kind of our cultural resource emergency response led by Martha Battle Jackson. And not only um, were these staff members extremely proficient in making sure to check in on all of our sites um, in terms of our collections um, being safe and um, if need be moved, um, but they also have been working across the department and in grassroots communities and other nonprofit museum spaces to help support recovery efforts. Um, and we're going to continue to do community outreach as the governor has um, encouraged. Our regional supervisors basically did not sleep. Um, they were on call 24-7 for almost two weeks, checking in on um, the need to share emergency closure due to flooding. Um, and so really a, a powerful team effort. Um, you all can see in the photographs that flooding was, was a significant issue for places like Town Creek, House on the Horseshoe. There was also what we were calling wind-driven rain that came into um, some of our buildings. I'm, I'm hearing a little background noise, but I'm going to continue. Um, some wind-driven rain that made it into some of the windows, and so we're dealing with um, a little bit of damage there. But all in all, because of all of the strong um, staff professionalism and, and really um, following, going above and beyond best practices, we're in a phenomenal place. Dr. Cherry, the secretary, Secretary Hamilton, and I had a chance to spend time with the Brunswick Town Fort Anderson staff yesterday at the site. So we had a chance to see the trees that were down. And then one thing that was really, um, I think, exciting for us to see is how well the wave attenuator, am I using the right language there, Dr. Cherry? That's the right. wave attenuator, the wave attenuator system um, that helps to protect further erosion of our historic um, waterfront worked beautifully. We did not lose waterfront. That's so important for archaeological reasons. Um, we did not lose that waterfront. And, and so that wave attenuator more than paid for, um, you know, what we invested uh, in, in that technology. I'll be happy to answer a few questions. I will say that I will be in just a moment um, coming off of the call because we're going to be interviewing to replace um, our long-term research historian, uh, Marty Matthews, who's moved on to do work with um, in South Carolina, but we are in the process of interviewing for his replacement. So I will transition off um, in, unless there are any questions. Thanks for the Thank great you. job you've done, Michelle. Excellent. Thank you. So I will quickly uh, go over other aspects of the Office of Archives and History's response or prep and response to Hurricane Florence. Most of you may not know the role that we play in emergency preparedness, emergency response, and a little bit of emergency recovery. So our state archives is the point of contact for local government records and other critical records for communities, meaning hospital records, those sorts of things. We had approximately 40 counties originally that the state archives contacted government record keepers before the hurricane and right after the hurricane. Um, because of our constant contact with the county, uh, with the record keepers in the counties, um, a lot of the prep work, a lot of the upfront work had been done in the courthouses. And even though at least one courthouse flooded, um, we did not lose any county court records. We do not have as much contact with municipal record keepers as we would like to have. Um, and we have, we think, lost well, some municipal records, but we don't know how much of those records are um, permanently valuable. So that's the archives role. The Historic Preservation Office role um, provides environmental review for FEMA and other federal actors following a uh, disaster. 
So we help find proper places for um, lay down of, of debris, for temporary housing, um, all of those sorts of things. But And you sort of expect that. But we also had NOAA contacting our underwater archaeology branch to be able to map underwater archaeological resources in case they had to do channel clearing. They weren't going to be destroying underwater archaeological sites that are on the National Register. Um, so that is the role of the Historic Preservation Office. They are now going in in recovery phase, providing technical assistance in communities to people who have historic structures, whether they're on the National Register or not, and helping them bring back their historic structures in the most appropriate manner. And so we're having community meetings. We're providing direct uh, assistance to individual homeowners, and we're meeting with certified local government uh, folks who work on the ground in historic preservation in local government. So that's the Historic Preservation Office role. Then our department maintains something called the Cultural Resources Emergency Support Team, or CREST, and that is helping uh, that, that group of people, you can think of them as a volunteer fire department, where other museums around the state agree to let some of their staff go and help other museums in cases of disaster. And those individuals bring their professional skills to the task but they also, through our coordination, receive emergency training, FEMA emergency training, so that they know the basics of recur recovery on top of their uh, conservation skills or other professional skills that they know from their work. And we've had, um, we've, we've provided a lot of technical assistance to small museums uh, and mid-sized museums, but we've also had two response teams of volunteers, including people from our own department who have gone into the um, Harker's uh, Island Waterfowl Museum and Heritage Center and help them evacuate out items and save their artifacts, and also the Lumbee Indian Cultural Center in Pembroke that uh, was flooded and helped them save a lot of both their artifacts and their archival materials. So Crest has done a tremendous amount of work uh, with uh, local communities. So I commend them. Now, outside of historic sites, some of our damage, the battleship lost its water and sewer lines underneath the river. We're getting that back. The roof on the visitor center was peeled off about halfway. Enough water got inside of the visitor center that we've had to gut the entire visitor center for the battleship. Um, at Tryon Palace, the palace was not damaged. But the North Carolina History Center, which is the regional history museum that goes along with the palace, um, did take on water. We've had to rip up the carpets. The plaza around the history center does, is not built on pilings like the building is. So the, the plaza on the outside of that building slumped or settled more. In front of the building, it wasn't so bad. In the back of the building, it pulled the ramp and the steps and other and other ways of getting into the building away from the building, so that is not safe. The Pepsi Family Center, which is the computerized educational play space, all of the wires were in the floor. All of those wires were wet. All of that technology has to be pulled out. So we will be doing an upgrade to the Pepsi Family Center and putting in new technology there. The Douglas Complex, which is the former African-American uh, Catholic Church in Newburn, which was uh, sold to the state. We used it as an artifact storage center for many years and also uh, exhibit design shop. The, the roof has been leaking for a few years. We just were about ready to go out for bid to put a new roof on the, ha on the facility, and the hurricane hit and the roof and the ceiling failed totally. We're hoping to do something about artifact storage in Newburn by finding another facility because we're going to have to move everything out of that building anyway to fix that building. We have lots and lots of leaks from windblown rain. In our historic buildings, the one that got affected the worst was the Dixon House where the plaster took on a great deal of water. The most interesting story from Trine Palace is what happened at the Stanley House, 
where the shutter was blown off by the wind, uh, and then the wind picked up an acorn, fired it through the window, and took out a crystal bowl from one of the crystal chandeliers. So we're going to keep that acorn and make that a part of the story of the artifact. Um, <laughs> at, the, at the Maritime Museum in um, Beaufort, we're going to need a totally new roof. We'd hope that we'd be able to patch the roof, but the roof is totally gone. So we're going to have to get a, a new roof over the Maritime Museum in Beaufort. At the uh, Museum of the Cape Fear in Fayetteville, we have some serious roof leaks. We're going to have to fix those roof uh, that, those leaks soon. Um, the Watercraft Center at Beaufort is designed to take on water, but the equipment inside the Watercraft Center is not designed to take on water. So we're not certain how much of the equipment has been lost, but we know that a lot of that equipment was damaged because the water came up much higher than we ever expected it to come. An underwater archaeology branch there right behind Fort Fisher State Historic Site. That's a compilation of about four World War II era temporary, temporary buildings for World War II. Uh, the office building sits right on the sand. It took a lot of water. We will not be able to go back into that building. So underwater archaeology is going to have to find another, another place to work from. Uh, and Michelle mentioned the canoe that the, that the Transportation mu Museum moved out of there. It wasn't just any canoe. It was a thousand-year-old canoe, one of our most precious underwater archaeological artifacts. And so it was the only artifact that we actually picked up and trucked across the state to evacuate it. So it's a very special item, and it's under treatment right now. Um, something that you maybe haven't considered, this is not physical damage, but this will have some lasting effect on Office of Archives and History institutions. One third of our budget in Archives and History now comes from receipt generation, rental, ticket sales, special events. Our receipt generation, especially at Trine Palace, Roanoke Island Festival Park, the Battleship, and the Transportation Museum has been greatly affected. And those institutions depend upon that money a great deal. Trine Palace runs off of 50% receipts. The Transportation Museum runs off of 88% receipts. Roanoke Island Festival Park is around 70% receipts. The Battleship is 100% receipt driven. On one event alone, the Transportation Museum is down $100,000. So this is going to have a great impact upon the Office of Archives and History, and we are trying to get rainy day money to cover these non-physical damages to the Office of Archives and History. I do want to commend everyone for um, all of the work that they have done. We could have sustained a great deal more damage to our facilities if our staff had not gone out and done the standard things that are so easily overlooked and just said, oh, it's just another hurricane, it's not going to come here. But we did all the work about making sure the water runs away from the building, putting our, our trucks out in the middle of open fields, all of that basic stuff ended up saving so many of our facilities and so much money for our department. But make no mistake, Hurricane Florence has really, really walloped the Office of Archives and History. That's our report. Well, again, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Cherry, and to the entirety of the staff. And I do think that's uh, a yeoman's job, but it is what it is, and I particularly appreciate your comment about the receipts and the impact of that in terms of funding, um, as, as we hope we can get some rainy day help and assistance in that. No pun intended, uh -huh. rainy day. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, I would like then to, to ask you to introduce, and, and before we go to the next segment, which is to discuss the various matters uh, on the agenda, I know commission members through Parker Backstrom were provided uh, detailed information about these uh, various properties. 
but I'd also like to invite the public that may be wanting to follow this in more detail. Uh, these items can be found on the website of the North Carolina uh, Department of, uh, of, of the Natural and Cultural Resources at www.ncdr.gov slash nchc, which is for the North Carolina Historical Commission. And you should be able to follow if you're so interested in some of the detail that we'll be discussing for the remainder of the agenda of today's program. Mr. Chairman, just one slight correction there. It's www.ncdcr.gov slash nchc. I think there was a C missing um, in what you read right. out. Thank you, Phil. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll now ask our um, Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer, Ramona Bartos, to begin by introducing the first action and comment, and Renee Gladhill early to join her in uh, providing other information. Ramona? Thank you, Dr. Cherry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing us to make these presentations today. I have four on my list, and I wanted to start with the Enterprise Street uh, matter, but before we get there, I would like to just remind everyone the purpose of 12 a uh, It is a state statute that requires the review and advisory comment by this body to any applicant at the state agency or seeking state funding um, that may have an adverse effect on historic resources that are listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And so each one of these rises to that level. We consulted with Dr. Cherry, uh, who was in agreement as to that um, determination. And so the purpose of the body here is to hear what the concerns are uh, and to provide any advisory comments to the state actor or agency, as the case may be, and then they can take those into account and then they may go forward with what their proposal is. That's the way that the law works. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer sort of that umbrella explanation. Otherwise, I'll move into the actual cases. If I may uh, use the prerogative of the chair on this, it's for the perhaps for the public's uh, awareness. This is more of an advisory collaborative discussion. Is that a fair way to characterize that as opposed to an up or down vote to say we we uh, approve this or not approve this? It is, it's not the role of the historical commission to approve or disapprove the action, but to provide advice and commentary on how best to undertake the action to have the least of negative effect. Correct. And it, we are providing recommendations, and it is the body's prerogative to take those uh, or to offer others or to offer some, not whatever the case may be. Thank you, Ramona. Um, all right, so the first case is uh, 11 Enterprise Street in Raleigh, and I'd like to acknowledge that we have Jenny Askew, who's with NC State, uh, with the real estate office, and I might ask her to end my comments. All right. You, Mr. Chair, to provide any comments she might have as well. Um, this is a, a pretty straightforward proposal to demolish a building that is located in the West Raleigh National Register Historic District. The Historic District itself is over 300 acres with more than 1,100 buildings. And it really gives you a, a sense of the, the kind of residences that were built around NC State in that part of Raleigh, uh, many of which were uh, the residences of professors and others that were uh, affiliated with the university. The particular property here was built in 1925, and it's the Vaughn House. Uh, professor Lillian Vaughn was a professor at the College of Agriculture and Engineering. Um, this particular property has had a property inspection report prepared by, uh, by the university stating that the house and garage are in poor condition, not dilapidated, but poor condition that could be uh, addressed through some uh, rehabilitation and then reused. However, the proposal here is not for that to take place, but rather the, the university wishes to demolish the house and garage to avoid unlawful use, nuisance, and that sort of thing, and any liability to the university. Uh, at this point, my understanding is they have no stated plans for the future use of the site. It is adjacent to North Hall, which is a student dormitory. Um, our recommendation here is that there are a few options available to the commission. What we would like to offer, and we've already started discussions with Ms. Askew and her colleagues, is to start working with them in a more collaborative way to do some sort of early warning 
uh, some due diligence to assist them with that um, so that we can have some earlier input um, for these kinds of proposals and perhaps uh, give more alternatives uh, at an earlier uh, stage of the planning process for NC State for any of their peripheral activities. Um, so, and that's not just for NC State. We make that offer to all of the universities through the, the university system. So that's that's my comment, Ms. Askew. Um, thank you so much for letting me listen in and and um, be part of the meeting. This is this property is being acquired as part of the university's attempt to kind of is, is almost right across the street from the university. It does back up to one of our residence halls. There is a lot of development going on on the outskirts of the university with private developers. And so we are at this point just sort of trying to protect our front door. Um, but we have seen a lot of vagrancy in the area as well. We don't have the funding to do anything with these buildings since they're under state ownership. We also can't lease them out. It's a difficult process to lease them out to private tenants. And so, um, we are at this point just asking for permission to demolish the building. They're not in they're not in great condition anyway. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions. Ramona's right, we don't currently have a plan for that, um, but we are trying to um, to protect the front door of the university is essentially what we're doing right now. Is there are there any comments or questions? relative to the item uh, on enterprise, the demolition of the uh, 11 Enterprise Street in Wally. Um, this Michigan. is Valerie here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes mm -hmm. I just want to express my dismay that yet again we're here with a, um, I can, well, let me back up. Thank you, Ramona, for your due diligence and bringing this to our attention again and following through with the recommendation that the, there be more conversation before we get to the point of destruction. And I just wanted to re to emphasize that we really prefer that being proactive rather than reactive because here we're losing another structure and it's not just another one. If I'm not mistaken, this has something to do with women's contributions to um, early history at the university and we're going to lose that visual marker and I just wanted to express my dismay at this prospect again and remembering back through the years we keep coming with this issue with universities um, destroying rather than trying to really preserve their history. Thank, thank you Dr. Thank you. Johnson. Yeah, this is Sam Dixon. I, I agree uh, with Dr. Johnson, and especially, you know, um, a, a place that it should be preserving their past. I just can't figure out why we keep having this problem with with universities. But I'm really, it, it saddens me, and I wish they would look for another resolution for this property. Uh, th this is Dr. Fonville. I, I concur. Uh, this seems to be a very important. Uh, uh, residents, uh, as it reflects the contributions of uh, um, female uh, educators in the early days of uh, NC State, and I don't understand why the university didn't take a more proactive role before now. Um, why was it allowed to? Why was the residents allowed to get to this condition now that it's now it's threatened? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me jump in to clarify. The university or the state only acquired this property um, a month ago. It was under private ownership until then. That, that oh, was the okay. fact. <clears throat> My apologies, then. I did not see that in the report, Adam. Um, is is there are there any? Uh, Additional comments, or do I hear a motion to accept the recommendation of staff or any modifications thereof? This is Mary Lynn Bryan. I, I, um, I recommend that, that we accept the staff recommendations. Uh, a second? 
This is Barbara Snowden. I second that motion. Okay, it has been um, moved and, and seconded. Um, I will ask, uh, because of this being a uh, teleconference, I will need to call the roll. Uh, Ms. Barbie, did were you able to join? Mr. Dixon? Yes. Dr. Fonville? Yes. Ms. Klotz? Either. You might. You might still be on mute. Uh, Ms. Klotz, are you on mute by chance? I know you're on yes. the. I, I okay. Agree. Thank you. I understand. It happens to all of us. Uh, Dr. Bryan. Yes. Yes. And uh, did I call for Dr. Johnson? I'm sorry, Dr. Johnson. Yes. And uh, Ms. Snowden. Yes. And uh, David Ruff and I say yes. I, I think uh, if I may introduce the spirit of this conversation would imply that we feel very strongly that the message should be sent in addition to accepting the recommendations of staff that we feel very sensitive about the timing timeliness of being uh, informed of these issues, particularly as it relates to demolition. That's kind of a binary a process that just almost puts you in a, a win no win situation and therefore we do feel in the spirit of the commission I think I'm reflecting that that we feel very strongly about being notified as early as possible so that there can be other um, alternative steps taken perhaps before we get to the point of some entity deciding that they're already at the point of demolition and we do have thorough documentation of the Okay. Thank you. Okay. We will note same in our letter back to NC State. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, the next matter, Ramona, that you want to The next discuss. I have on my list is the Fairfield Inn in Suites in Morganton. Um, this has if you will, a widow's might of a state contribution in it. It's a $13 million project that would be located at 400 North Green Street, uh, which is in the North Green Street, Bushell Street National Register Historic District in Morganton. Um, the site on which it would be located is actually a series of vacant lots that have been vacant for nearly 25 years. So there's, there's, no, there's no structure that's being threatened by this. The issue here um, is that Main Street Solutions, which is part of the Department of Commerce, uh, their grant program is providing a $200,000 grant, which again is a widow's might compared to the uh, extent of the, the financial investment here. Um, the issue here is this district is largely a small scale individual home residential district. As with most um, uh, market uh, hotels, franchised hotels. This is a very large scale, four-story. Uh, it's being built on um, a lot that allows for topography to be capitalized on, but it is a very large scale um, building that is quite frankly out of scale with what the district is, the National Register District, and it is landing in the center of the district. Um, we have had a very cordial conversation with our Main Street colleagues, as well as the Main Street director at the municipal level in the city of Morgan, town of Morganton, and we have um, discussed various ways to mitigate this effect um, and how we can also be, again, part of the, the conversation earlier on in the process. So that's recommendation number one, is that we ask the Department of Commerce to direct applicants consult with us. We had heard in our consultation with the Main Street Director that it, it, she did not know that this was a National Register District, uh, had assumed that there would not be an issue, and was surprised to learn, even though we have a publicly accessible uh, GIS mapping enterprise, that within a couple of moments one can bring up any address and see what is there. Uh, as far as this particular project, we have asked, and, and Ms. 
Jablonski, who is the local Main Street director, is agreeable to doing this and funding this, is to have a consultant come and survey and reevaluate that National Register District, which was listed approximately 30 years ago, uh, to see if there are any additional properties that could be brought into the district and therefore be made eligible for the use of historic tax credits for their rehabilitation. Because the period, what we would call the period of significance for this particular district would have ended, I think, in 1936, if I'm not mistaken. So we're now at 1968 for the time period that we're interested in. So there's 30 years potentially of additional building stock that could be included in this district. And then based on the results of those uh, survey uh, efforts to figure out whether or not we can increase, decrease, adjust the boundaries, and hopefully increase the boundaries of that district. We also are suggesting the city should understand any development of a vacant <coughs> adjacent lot will be subject to our review if federal funds or permits are required under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, this is a from what we've been made to understand, a very big economic driver, at least the hope is. Uh, local uh, business that nearby uh, those same individuals are wanting to invest in the property. So again, the, the state's part of this is, is very minimal. I, my, my math is not even 5% um, of this particular project. So that, those are our comments. Ramona, is there a presumption here that this uh, recommendation would be codified in, in written form in some way, I guess, rather than uh, just a verbal. We provide a letter after the meeting. We will write, we will develop a letter to uh, transmit the recommendations of the Historical Commission to the state agency and to the Main Street Solutions for them to make their decision of whether or not to accept those recommendations. Okay. But as Ramona noted, Mr. Jablonski, the Main Street Manager, has said that the city is on a board with the recommendations that we've offered so far. Is on board. Yes, yes. is on board okay. and, and, ha and is willing to provide the local funding to accomplish this. So, it's, it, again, it is not a matter of any kind of destruction of, it's more potentially an aesthetic. It's, um, it's an incongruous yes, development yes, incongruous. compared to what's around it. Okay. Do I... Uh, then ask for any further discussion uh, or questions of staff on this matter. Not hearing any, uh, do I hear a motion to accept the recommendations of staff or any modifications thereof? I, I make the motion that we accept the recommendations. Follow Thank you, Dr. Yes. Do I hear a second? Second, Sam Dixon. Uh, the motion made by Dr. Bomville, seconded by Mr. Dixon, uh, to accept the recommendations of staff on the matter of the uh, Fairfield um, Inn and Suites in Morganton. Uh, I will uh, call the roll. Uh, again, uh, Ms. Barbie, if you are on. Uh, Mr. Dixon? Yes. Dr. Bomville? Yes. Ms. Klutz? Yes. Uh, Dr. Johnson? Yes. Uh, Dr. Bryan? Yes. And Ms. Snowden? Ms. Snowden? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I, as Chairman David Ruffin, yes. <clears throat> okay. The next matter, Ramona. Uh, Mr. Chair, we'll remain in Morganton but go down the street to the former school of the deaf, um, which is going to be transformed very shortly, we understand, into the North Carolina School of Science and Math. And we have with us today Mr. Eddie Belk, who is the architect for that project. Um, we have been concerned for some years about the former school of the deaf. It has some beautiful landmark buildings um, that have for a variety of reasons, not received uh, maintenance over the years, uh, delayed maintenance. And so we've been very concerned that those buildings find a reuse, and now that seems to be the case. However, um, of, of the buildings in the district that will be reused, 
Um, there is an infirmary that was built in 1918. However, it has had two modern wings put on it as well. That would be, if, if you will, sacrificed um, to make room for an amphitheater and, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, a new commons, quote-unquote, commons academic building. However, the three buildings, uh, again, we had great concern over the years about Goodwin Hall, Joyner Hall, and the Cattle Barn, all, again, within this National Register. Historic District will be given this attention that they have deserved for so long, and will have a new use for a new generation of students that are interested in education and science and math fields. Um, so, again, this is not the most optimal outcome, but given that we did not have any uh, plan for those buildings, uh, and I, I say we, the state, uh, until recently, this is a very, um, very positive development, and we are regret regretting the loss of the infirmary, um, but we understand that all of the, the projects will, these buildings that I've mentioned, will be um, accomplished, the rehabilitation will be accomplished with the Secretary of Interior Standards, and I would say, uh, for my part, Mr. Belk has a very long career and expertise uh, in dealing with historic buildings, and given that he is involved with the project, that gives us a great deal of, of comfort. And I, I invite to start with you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Yes, Mr. Belk, Mr. Belk like thank comment. you for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate you coming today. Is there any other comments you would like to make? If I may add, we also regret the uh, required loss of the infirmary. Mm -hmm. We are quite excited about the role the other three buildings will be able to play in the campus. Uh, my firm, in partnership with Duda Payne, has gone through multiple master plans for the new Western Campus of the School of Science and Math. And a lot of the planning revolved around how does the academic flow of program within the structures work and how does it allow efficient and productive growth of the campus as it goes from its initial 300 students to most likely equaling the school here in Durham, which is close to 660 students now. And the final result did make Goodwin Hall the front door of the campus. It is actually the first experience that parents and a student would have in arriving at the new School of Science and Math campus. And it's a very elegant building, extremely elegant building. We'll provide four floor levels of space, both for academic and administrative requirements. And then further down the backbone of the campus, Joiner Hall, will be dedicated to the arts and will provide for physical art, um, academic education, as well as theater. And then the barn is so dramatic in its setting on that knoll looking out over the valley and will become a major gathering place and assembly for the full student body and the staff and for parents on special events and to be utilized by the Morgan community for special events. And it will seat 420 people within what is now a very dramatic and, and uh, underutilized cattle barn structure on campus. So we're very excited about what we're able to put those three to. We're Regretting the loss of the infirmary, as stated, the wings added to the infirmary are not really considered contributing, and they did significantly modify the two end elevations of the original building. And if we had been able to develop the master plan of the campus to try to utilize the original contributing structure of the infirmary, it fights us on reuse because the interior is designed into a program of very small spaces for the infirmary needs. Um, as Ramona Artos indicated, as a history of working with historic structures, my first historic adaptive renovation was 1979. And as I was reminded last night in a presentation to the Alamance County Historic Commission for our Granite Mill project, I was stating these facts, and one of my staff, Aaron Morton, was standing next to me, and I stated that we have this length of experience 
And one of the commissioners corrected me later and said she cannot have that length of experience since she wasn't born until 89. <laughs> <laughs> so I now have a lot of projects that are much older than some of my staff, but they're all very good. We have now uh, provided adaptive renovation within historic guidelines of 74 buildings, and we hope to do any more. Thank you for your help on this one. Thank you. I, there's one clarification on this. Th this is not the uh, 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 giving up any land. It's just basically a demolition of the infirmary, right? And the reason I'm a little bit, it's on me probably, the confusion was that there's been a demarcation around what appeared, it's not being extracted from this. Yeah. There are 800 acres in the Broughton, quote unquote, right. Broughton property that the well, School of the Deaf well, is also Bra part. Broughton is separate. Right, but this is in the same sort of state complex. Okay. Right. An island. It's, it's, it's an island. Broughton Hospital. Hospital. Right. No, it's not. Okay. And this is right. to the okay. south and west of Broughton. The okay. hospital is over here, but there is a big conglomeration of state land doing different state activities. Right. And the museum, I mean, the the, the School for the Deaf is, in this is a part of that. I see. And that encompasses the entire School of the Deaf, deaf not just the infirmary part. So, uh, That's right. I think it's a, li it's a little confusing, and the reason it's confusing is that we can't get the map right. to a size that can be shared easily. I so, the School for the Deaf Historic District is much expanded to the to the left and to the west of the map the collage map that you're looking at. Broughton Hospital is lower and yeah. over to the right to the east. Mm -hmm. And what they're looking at is just this wing of the School for the Deaf. Mm -hmm. And it, Mr. Chairman, if I can, can comment, I've, I've been working at this job now for almost 40 years. And this has been one of those properties that you just, your heart cries, because I've gone there with developers who were interested in doing affordable housing and other reuses of this area, and they would take one look at those two buildings and say, they've got to go. And they are in very poor condition. And that the School for the Deaf, uh, that the School of Science and Math is willing to take this effort. And the reason that we brought it to you now and we asked for the emergency meeting is that in order for them to get through the state building process and the approvals, they need to have it now because the, the building code will change in January and they would not be able to afford to do the work if they had to meet the new code. Everything will be safe, everything will be right, but the funding just wouldn't work. So they need to have your comments so that they can take them to state construction and move forward. And we would go to the Council of State on November the 6th, and we met with State Construction Office multiple times, and they're working with us, yeah. but we have to have the design development documents for this campus approved before December the 31st in order to be grandfathered in to the 2012 building code and not shifted into the 2018 building code. Primarily, it's mechanical code and structural code, but the new code will impact the cost of the project so dramatically that it would create a circumstance where we'd have to go back to the start and try to figure out how can we do this. Well, it sounds like compared to the enterprise issue, it is a tremendous amount of effort and uh, diligence has been done to try to save a greater portion of this. Is that a fair way to I characterize it? The Historic Preservation Office has been working with all of those state institutions for a number of years as they get reconfigured. So. And we commend your efforts on that. <clears throat> and, and I will say, eventually you will see it, but because this is close to the Broughton campus, Mr. Bell's also been involved in very yes, instrumental way in what, what the future could be for the Broughton campus. We're the campus architect well. member along with Stuart for master planning of the, uh, basically the brainstorming and master planning of the 
it's on the hospital site and all of the surrounding sites so that the 800 acres becomes an exciting full campus right. for that western part of the state. And one of my lifelong best friends is a Morganton native, uh, Robert Salisbury, an architect that practices there. And it's the delight of his career that this is finally happening. Well, we thank you again very much. Uh, any other comments or questions relative to this? I will say, and I believe Mr. Phelps is very agreeable to this, is that we would like to document the infirmary before it yes. does go away. Um, because, as you mentioned, it was built for that purpose, right. and it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting building for that, for that point. And we wish to help that in any way we can. Thank you, Ramona. Mr. Bell. Any other yeah. questions? Okay. This is Valerie again. I just appreciate this approach and want to echo what our chairman has said, that this is what we like to see happening and all the efforts to do the, the kind of preservation work that ne is necessary and documentation. So thank you. Absolutely, because the the issue here is it's not, we're just not being thrown a fait accompli almost. It's just, it's just testimony of all the effort that has been put into play here, and we do appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, this do is I hear Yes, Ms. Klutz. I have one uh, question, and I think this is a fabulous project, and I commend everyone for their role in making this um, happen. In the, but I do have one little, it's probably a typo, or it may not be, I may be wrong. In the third paragraph of the description of the project, it refers to a noted advocate and educator for the deaf. Was his name Dr. John McKee or John McKee Goodwin? John McKee Goodwin, and that's who Goodwin Hall is named after. Yes. Was Dr. John, wasn't there a Dr. John McKee that was the um, kind of director of the center for years also? I, I'm, I'm not certain about that, Ms. Glutz. I, I don't know. I have to look into that for you, Ms. Glutz. Right. That's just a question I had. I had I had been aware of Dr. John E. when he had a, a role in managing the facility, so the oversight of about that time. So I just wondered if that was. So there's a John McKee Goodwin and a potentially a John McKee. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, any other, uh, do I hear a motion then for acceptance of staff recommendations on the um, infirmary of uh, the School of Death? I move, I so move to accept the staff recommendations. Dr. Johnson has moved acceptance of the recommendation. Do I hear a second? Second. Has, okay. uh, Ms. Ross has seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye, and I will call the roll. Um, Mr. Dixon. Yes. Dr. Fondo. Yes. Ms. Klutz. Yes. Do Dr. Johnson. Yes. Dr. Bryan. Yes. Ms. Snowden. Yes. I take that as a yes. Yes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Snowden and David Ruffin. Yes. So, so it is accepted uh, unanimously. Thank you very much again to both of you for that report. Okay. Uh, other matter. We have tried, Mr. Chair, to sort of go from maybe not such a positive situation and moving right on up to a very positive situation. Morganton uh, School of Death gave us a, a feeling for what can be possible and. Our colleagues at the Division of State History Museums have brought this proposal forward. I will and note that Ken Howard, the Director of the State History Museums, has joined us for this portion of the meeting. And, and Mr. David Winslow, who is their consultant, is also here as well. Um, and I wanted to thank Mr. Winslow for all the materials he provided us in advance that, that aided us very much in preparing this report for you. I think the easiest thing to do maybe would be if you have the map, which Forgive me for my technical inadequacies, but what I was trying to do was portray the various moving pieces, literally in some cases, 
Well, we're on the North, excuse me, we're on the North Carolina. We're on the North Carolina State, 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 and Reconstruction History Center. No, our okay. yes. So it might be easiest for me to explain, and I'm, I'm very glad to have, have my colleague, Mr. Howard, type in if I get any of this wrong. But again, the materials are very helpful. Currently, the regional Cape Fear Museum building is housed in what was a late 1940s nurses, I believe nurses dormitory, um, and it was converted into museum uh, space later on. That is, you see, noted current Cape Fear Museum building, and you see around where the arsenal site itself was. This is at the northeast corner of what was the North Carolina State Arsenal. Uh, that then later was destroyed in 1865 by Sherman's army at the end of the Civil War. After the Civil War, the arsenal site was built upon and developed, as you can see, a residential subdivision, except for a couple of spots where the houses now have been removed. The dashed line that you see, rectangle, is the site to be developed at the New History Center. And as a reminder, um, many of the commission members were on the commission several years ago and might recall this, but this body has already approved the concept of this transformation of the regional museum into a more statewide thematic uh, museum uh, that will concentrate on the Civil War and Reconstruction story in North Carolina. So what, what, is, what has also happened, you will see, uh, which might be a little surprising to, to folks, is that there is a, a highway that goes through the middle of the arsenal site. And that happened prior to the environmental review laws that Renee uh, is tasked with dealing with um, to prevent such things. But apparently it was done with some, some sensitivity. So there is a bridge, a pedestrian bridge, that connects the area where the current Cape Fear Museum building is to the proposed new site. Um, what will happen is there will be a new building placed on that site, which is on the west side of, of Highway 40187. And several buildings that are now on the periphery will be brought in in a history village, as Mr. Winslow stated, um, which will allow them to get some attention, kind of a lot <coughs> along the lines of what we just discussed at the School of the Deaf. And the other plans that I've provided you show how those will be uh, assembled. And so I, I have listed the various locations of them. So we really have several National Register properties here. One is the, the Davis House was listed in another location, but now is sitting behind the Arsenal House, which I believe is one of the few houses still around that was associated historically with the Arsenal. So those are two National Register matters. And then the Culberth House, which is currently on, inside that dashed rectangle, would be shifted. So the Davis House and the Arsenal House would be brought into that area. And then the Poe House, which is currently inside the Poe Rental House, I should say. Um, there are two Poe Houses. EA Poe is over by where the museum is now. That'll stay there. But the Poe Rental House will be whisked away because that is in the place of where um, the new museum needs to go. So I hope that makes sense. I wish I had the technical skills to an animation that might have been helpful to understand this. But the archaeological aspect of this is, is very critical. The arsenal site itself, the area you see that is to be um, developed, is, has been checked out to a certain degree for archaeology, with which we uh, commend our division colleagues for that. Um, so we have some archaeological recommendations regarding that. But I guess before I go into the recommendations, given that there are so many moving pieces and parts to this, does, does that explanation make sense, one, to the committee? And is there anything Mr. Howard, Mr. Winslow might want to add to understand what's going on here? David, do you want anything? No, I think that's a great explanation. Okay. Uh, and I tried because I knew our commission members, all of this was probably new information. I tried to break it down into all of the different aspects of it. So I'm happy to go over any of that, but it's, it's outlined in the memo. So to that extent, because we have houses moving around and we have new construction and we have some ground disturbance that is proposed in the future, we have several recommendations to that end. Um, one is when the existing Cape Fear Museum is demolished, 
and it is not considered a contributing part, even though it's within the arsenal boundary, which is on the National Register. It is not considered part of its history for that purpose. Um, the National Register nomination, I went back and reread it very carefully. It talked about the fact that all the other buildings that were built after the Civil War were built on some kind of pylons or with very limited ground disturbance. This building, however, apparently has a partial basement of some sort. And the National Register nomination, which was done some time ago, talks about the belief that it could, when the partial basement was excavated for that existing building back in the 40s, that they believe that one of the towers and the officer quarters may have been impacted, meaning, and I've discussed this with state archaeologist John Mintz, that as that building goes down and goes away, that there needs to be some monitoring and potentially salvage archaeology because we don't know what, where the edges of that building, what, what you'll see. And I'm not sure if the basement could be filled in, I presume it would be. Um, but that may offer a very wonderful outreach possibility to say, oh, look what was down there. So that's the first is to so monitor. You may that want to explain the difference between monitoring and archaeological dig. Well, monitoring is as you're taking the building down to see what's being uncovered. And if there is something that comes up as part of that, there may need to be salvage archaeology or just leave it well enough alone. But we don't know until it goes away. So that's that's to be determined. And by the way, I will say before I go further, the our recommendation to the Division of State History Museums was to bring all of these activities together as a package to present to you. So we wouldn't have to go piecemeal as the project proceeds because the timeline for this is rather lengthy, mm -hmm. correct, Mr. Howard? Mm -hmm. So um, that way they already have this sort of already as a check mark for due diligence purposes. Um, as I mentioned, there has been some archaeological work already done on what's known as Arsenal Park, which is that dashed line rectangle to the west of the highway. That's what's considered a phase one, which is a, a basic, almost reconnaissance kind of survey. Um, New South Associates, which was hired to do this work, uh, made recommendations for phase two, more intensive, before the actual uh, building of the, the new um, history museum. And so those recommendations, which are more for the archaeologists to understand, uh, and they have provided that, are, are in here as well. Um, I'm going to add that we have followed all of those recommendations. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and then also the same that we've mentioned with demolition of the existing site, archaeological monitoring as the new site takes place. Um, and I will say this this particular museum design, there 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 is precedent in other states and other places like Jamestown, for example. If you have seen, <coughs> they have a history museum built on little pylons on top of the actual Jamestown site, and you look through the floor. I don't know if that's considered here, but you look through the floor and you can see that, and I've seen that in other countries as well. So this is not without precedent. Um, recommendation two, if you're familiar with Brunswick Town Fort Anderson or Fort Fisher, as Mr. Fonville probably is, it's not out of question that live ordinance can still be around. They certainly have found it down there. Um, we have heard anecdotal reports uh, from archaeologists who worked on this back in the day that there was belief that there was some ordinance found at some point. So um, state archaeologist John Mintz gave me some stories of, of some experiences he's had and anecdotally from other archaeologists. And as a matter of liability risk and managing that risk, we really recommend strongest terms that as a safety risk management measure that you have an ordnance sweep, which can be done gratis by the Army or the Marines. They have done that for us before, and they consider it a training exercise. And there's another wonderful outreach partnership opportunity. Um, and they can remove it, too. That's the other nice thing, and take it away where it can be dealt with. Um, we like the buildings that are to be moved, to be documented. And Mr. Winslow asked me before the meeting, what does that mean? Just walk around the building. Take photographs, um, and, and, and you know, we know what the interior will be because that will be intact. Yeah. So just where they currently are. Ramona, yes, sir. Ramona, question. You alluded to the Poe rental house being whisked away. Is, presumably that has no historic It has no historic uh, value for, <clears throat> for the purposes we're looking at. It's an older home. I forget yeah. now the dates on it. but 1905. But it's not to be destroyed, it's just to be moved elsewhere. Okay. And standard documentation is thorough photographs, measurements, and if there are architectural standout features, you take pictures of those. We don't measure. We, we don't measure. Yeah, we don't do measured drawing and that kind of thing. 
but just a photograph. Are you only looking for exterior photos? Yes. Okay. Um, and then for the buildings that are to be brought to the History Village, so to speak, um, and this is something that the museum division recommended that they will follow quote National Park Service standards, which Secretary of Interior standards, which are the ones we were just discussing with the schools of death. And then this again, this is something they've already committed to is to interpret exposed archaeological remains. And there is currently a ghost tower, which is not near one of the tower sites, but they would like to move it to one of the tower sites to be more accurate. And so those kind of reconstructions, if you've been to Philadelphia, you see uh, Benjamin Franklin's house, for example, is another example of very, very effective use of reconstruction. Those were our recommendations, again, following on things that they had already been suggested by the Division of State History Museum. And those are those are my comments from that memo. I wonder if maybe the gentleman here might have anything to say, if that's all right with you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Well, like, uh, like this, I was just reflecting, um, you know, I first visited the department in 1978, this is Larry Wheeler when he was the deputy secretary, so that's now 40 years. I think I've got you beat. Um, I want to thank for a moment and uh, for their work on this. Um, I told Renee before the meeting that you know, we're trying to do the best job we know how to do it and to have their expertise come to the fore. And you know, we've learned things from this process and we intend to do everything they recommended. Great. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Any comments or questions from the commissioners? And I, I believe this is just, one. just uh, one comment about salvage archaeology. Uh, in case ordinance is found, live ordinance is found, which is probably unlikely given the nature of the uh, the use of the site during the war. But in the possibility, make sure it's the U.S. Marines who come over to um, deactivate or whatever. The Marines will save what is discovered and return it to the site. The Army will destroy it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. The Marines will go out of their way to deactivate and then return the, the piece to the piece pieces to the site. Uh, the United States Army will destroy them. Chris, may I ask a question? David, David here. Um, we've already been in touch with the officials at Fort Bragg about uh, doing a sweep here. Um, their initial reaction, at least lower in the command, was that the ground penetrating radar that we had done for the entire site would have revealed anomalies. Um, and that they did not recommend that we go throughout to the site with a magnetometer. Uh, we took that, pushed it further up the command at Fort Bragg to try to get a different opinion because we knew that both John Mintz and New South felt pretty strongly that we needed to do something about that. And we continued to get pushback um, from, from, from Bragg and wanting to help us with that. So we would be very open to um, talking with anybody with, with anybody who has contact at Lejeune um, in terms of uh, um, some marine help we might get on this, um, we would very much appreciate that. Uh, I believe Mr. Yep. McCrossick Town knows who the marine mm, contacts okay. are. Thank you. Absolutely. Talk with Jim McKee, site supervisor at the Brunswick Town Fort Anderson State Historic Site. He has contacts uh, with EOD at Camp Lejeune. They have been very cooperative and very helpful. Um, again, it's unlikely you'll find ordinance at that site, but I would highly recommend doing uh, a survey, ground penetrating survey, and it doesn't have to be done by the Army. You, uh, you can check with the geology department at Fayetteville State University. Uh, UNCW has the equipment to do it, and maybe some of the closer university geology departments would have the equipment to do it as well. That's a good idea. NC State might like, mm -hmm. good prospect. But Jim McKee will know the people to contact at Camp Lejeune. Absolutely. And they've been very helpful and very interested in preserving artifacts, whereas the Army will destroy them. Mm -hmm. Margaret, that may be your Mr. McKee. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, well, and I'll be glad to help in any way that I can. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Dr. Fonville. Um, are there any other comments or questions? Do I hear a motion for acceptance of staff recommendations and comments uh, relative to the matters of the NC Civil War and Reconstruction History Center and the uh, arsenal uh, area in specific? to accept or modify any any motions on the floor for that? Well, I so move that I've, we accept the recommendations. Dr. Pomville has moved. And I, I second second. that. Dr. Johnson has second. I will call the roll, and I believe that this was the uh, matter that Dr. Bryan had asked to recuse herself from, so we will call the roll on this. Uh, Dr. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Dixon. Yes. Dr. Fonville? Yes. Mrs. Klutz? Yes. Dr. Johnson? Yes. Mrs. Snowden? Yes. And David Ruffin, yes. Okay, it is approved unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. Again, very, very comprehensive report. Thank you to each of you for all the uh, great work. This is, is, if anything, sounds like a validation of, of a, a lot of good work, and we appreciate that very, very much. So, Mr. Chairman, we will probably have an end-of-the-year conference call meeting of the Commission for accession so that individuals who've made donations of artifacts to our sites and museums can get the tax benefit in this year. That's the only other meeting that I foresee us having, and the only issue to come before the commission at that meeting would be accession. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cherry. Having uh, completed our stated agenda, then I call for a, um, a motion of adjournment. I don't know who moved and who seconded, but I assume that. Yeah, thank you all very, very much. And again, unfortunately, uh, we're at the cusp of another hurricane. Um, I just hope and pray that we are not having another repeat or any variant of, of what we have to do with Mars. But it does not like it's a very weak storm by any stretch of the imagination. So, again, thank you all for your participation and apologize again for some of the technical problems we had on the front end of this uh, of this meeting today. Thank you all. Everyone you. stay safe. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, especially my Downey's people. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.